This is Alan here at NEB, actually in the human eye suite at NEB. Yep. And I'm with Jim Malcolm. Jim, sh uh, you've got stuff to tell me about your you know, VR stuff. We got, we got stuff. We have a lot of really good stuff. And I, I think I want to start this conversation by telling you a little bit about what we've been doing the last couple of days and, um, and kind of where we're going with some of the creator. So okay. here at NAB 2019, rather than us taking a booth space and waiting for our customers to come to us, we did things a little bit different this year. We moved our booth over here to the Encore Suites, uh, and we're holding a series of seminars that are small. We have somewhere between eight and 10 people per seminar. Um, and we've got seminars going on every day of the event. And we bring people in for a three hour immersive training and understanding about both VR 180, right? So when you have left and right eyes, right. but also 360 imaging using one of our new cameras called the Views XR. But this really helps them understand imaging on a mobile phone, imaging for a uh, virtual reality headset, right. right? All of those types of pieces. So that's what we've been doing here. And you know, with that, I'd love to talk to you about anything you think would be interesting to your, uh, to your audience. Oh, well, well, tell us a little bit about the history of VR, you know, uh, you know virtual reality. I mean, or, or, because you're, you, you, you've been in it a long time, right? I've been in it a long time. Now, a lot of people think that VR is two to three years old. Right. Uh, it's not. It, it's oh. been around much, much longer. Um, I don't have the actual dates in front of me, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm sure people who are watching are going to throw stones. Um, but you, know, you can go all the way back into the 50s, and there were systems that you sit into with big TV screens and that kind of stuff to make VR. Um, there's been all kinds of big helmets over the years that have been made. Again, I'm not going to try to ramble names of things because right. uh, I'll get them wrong. Uh, but in fact, we had a guy in one of our seminars who's been in VR for 20 years. Wow. And we think, wow, did, was VR really around 20 years ago? And the answer is yes, because creators have been finding and trying to find new and more interesting ways to get people to interact with the pictures, video, sound, sure. everything around them. And, and we've had interactivity for quite a while, you know, right. via DVD and Laserdisc. That's right. You know. And so when you take that interactivity and you add on top of that immersion and or interaction with that video, then you, you add it to one of these ridiculous things that we call headsets. Right. And, and I mean that in the nicest ways because I think this is absolutely the best product in the market right now and as far as the industry is concerned, as far as advancing headsets. But I give it a little bit of a tongue in cheek because it's a scuba mask. Right? <laughs> it's big, it's heavy. People are like, oh, I'll be embarrassed if I wear it. You know, there are all kinds of excuses why they don't wear it. Those people usually haven't worn one and right. they don't know what's really going on in the headset. So they really don't know for a large extent what they're talking about. So here's what I try to tell people. Don't think of a VR headset as a headset. Oh, okay. Think of a VR headset as a screen because right. all there is in here are two eyes, and inside those eyes are screens. Right. Think about it, it's a screen that sits close to your eye. Right. right. That makes sense. So I might shoot for a motion picture and a you know, huge screen. I might shoot for a TV in my living room or a computer on my desk, or I might shoot for a mobile phone. If you're a creator, you're going to use different tools when you make all of those experiences. Well, I've right. used something similar to that called a camera you know, viewfinder. Yep. You know, especially with video cameras, they had portable viewfinders that sure. you could attach to the camera. And I was looking at a single screen, not two, like you are with a VR headset. Yep. And back in the old days, when you did have that, even in some of the modern screens, right? And you got that mono view, shoulder mounted. Yeah. 640 pixel resolution. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't read your fonts or your fonts had to be huge in order to read them. Yeah. But it was a utility that allowed you to do something. It right? did. And so now you look at like Sony's got these amazing electronic viewfinders using OMOLED displays and you don't see the pixels. And like, just think about it. That's a great example that I haven't pointed out before. Like, look at the evolution that that oh like, EVF God. has done oh over the years. Oh my God, yes. We are at, right, that Betacam shoulder mounted 640 resolution black and white. Oh, this is color. Yeah. But that's, yeah. that's the phase that we're at. I totally agree right because when I look in these things, I can see the pixels. I can, you know, uh, it's not a clear image like uh, a 1080p image, you know, if I'm watching on a TV screen. You're right. It's not. And, you know, if you think about 
the regular printing industry, like printing on paper, right? Right. Newspapers are printed at very low resolution, right? Photos are printed at roughly 300 uh, points of resolution. Yeah. A billboard, right? When you're driving down the right. road, you see that billboard? They're printed at 12 DPI, 12, 12. dots. Wow. That's right. So because of our distance, right? Right. Exactly. We look at it and go, wow, that looks like a photo. Yeah. If you walked up to that billboard, you'd see all the little pixels that oh. make up the picture. And you do. Mosaic. And you absolutely do. And that's why it was so cool at uh, you know, CES this year, I went and saw the 8K TVs. Yeah. You could walk right up to that screen and not see any pixels. That's right. But even when you walk right up to that screen, you're not making it as close as this is. Right. Right. And so that's, that's correct. That's the hard part that, you know, that's correct. Pe- wait, when you look at these headsets and you look at those little well, lenses that are in there, they're magnifying glasses. So in reality, you're not really looking at your whole screen. You're looking at a magnified right. part yeah. of that screen. Well, they call this a retina screen, but if you look under, you know, with just a loop on here, you can see the pixels. Okay, so that, you it's know, that's a really, it's a really interesting point. So I think this is important to realize. Remember I talked about that billboard? Right. Think about a eight by 10 print, a photo print. Think about your mobile phone, a display is really optimized and intended to be viewed at three times the diagonal. Okay. Okay? Yeah. For it to be, not to be able to perceive that, right? So uh, in this room, your viewers can't see it, but there's a 50 inch TV. Right. Right? That TV is really intended for optimal picture to be viewed at at least 150 inches away, three times that diagonal. Yeah. If this is a six, or you know yeah. so whatever this is. Let's just say this is a seven inch screen, twenty one inches, right? right. Th- that I'm going to view this. If I bring this closer, yes, I might I might see those pixels. Right. Um, you think about um, you know printing most your home printers and stuff. Right. They're going to print it three hundred DPI, right. right? Dots per inch. Right. Postage stamps, which are very small. Right. They're actually etched and printed at thirty five hundred DPI. Wow, I did not know that. Because it's small. And then you bring it close to your eye. Yes, you do. Right? You can look at a postage stamp and it has to be able to... And people look at them under magnifiers and things of that nature. All all kinds of different things. So imagine the resolution of these screens and you having to bring that little part close to your eye. I'm glad you brought up 8K video because that's interesting. Right now we look at these big screens. 8K video in a big screen with a large viewing distance. Okay, maybe you see some sharpness or uh, contrast differences. You might have some other benefits as far as putting 3D because you can share some of those pictures, like a lot of different reasons. But what I love about it, which hasn't happened yet, by the way, but now that there are fab sites that can make a, go back to that 50 inch TV example. Right. A 58 inch TV, instead of 4K, it's 8K. Right. Right. That means you have four times the pixels in every space. Absolutely. Okay. If you cut that display up now that there's fab sites and put it into something this size or something this size, now you have four times the Resolution. resolving power. And, it, and, and again, it'll give you more of a world view, a real, out, a real view of looking at an image, especially if it's a high resolution image. That's right. But it doesn't stop with just the resolution of the screen. No. Right? So the resolution of the screen is very important, obviously. And we wanted that to always get Better and say always. I think you get to a point where we're going to hit a point at some point that's good enough. Right. Well, but this is an example. I mean, yeah, exactly. I can't see the right. pixel because I'm looking at this distance. That, that's right. But in this, we have a lot of things that we can work with. So I'm not a headset manufacturer, by the way. Right. I'm a camera manufacturer. I just happen to play in this space a lot, and that's the only reason I'm sharing my opinion. If any of your viewers think I'm off base or know that I'm off base, <laughs> put it in the comments below, and I'll be happy to, you know sit there and, and, and talk with you about it. But what I wanted to point out is this. These are magnifying glasses. They're Fresnel lenses. When you look through there, we're magnifying that screen. There are other things happening in that optical field. One in particular is something called chromatic aberration. Yes. Right, so as the lens is going, you get weird flares. Um, it looks like you actually have almost a ghost image against Or a it. rainbow effect. Or a rainbow, yep. Yeah, because yeah, so my glasses these. will do that on the edges. Exactly but there's some really interesting technology that instead of solving for chromatic aberration with optics, Mm -hmm. you can digitally correct for a lot of chromatic aberration 
using the digital processing power of a headset. Now, right now, it's That's difficult to do it because you don't necessarily know where somebody's eyes are, and right. your IPD or your inter or your inner pupil distance really affects how you see these. Right? I have a hard time with these. My eyes are not very wide apart; they're more narrow. Mm -hmm. um, more narrow. That's a good point narrow. because everyone's eyes are different in terms Ex of distance. Exactly. So some headsets actually you can move those lenses back and forth and adjust for your IPD, your inner pupil distance. Some of them have an aperture that you look through that's more of an oval shape. Mm -hmm. And that way it, you have a, a wider sweet spot. Right. So you have a better likelihood of being able to be seen. But there's technology like eye tracking. Right. Right. So in the near future, when I put on an eye tracking headset, I can digitally measure very precisely my IPD, my inner pupil distance. I can adjust the placement of those uh, optics, either mechanically or digitally, to match my eyes. And I can put in a digital offset to my video that will actually remove chromatic aberration very precisely. Interesting. Because I, I'll put in an, an artifact, basically, that then gets canceled out by the uh, failure of the lens. And of course, seeing that artifact in the, right now, that takes you away from the reality of what you're looking at. Yeah, you know, you really bring up a really important part, and it was a big part of our discussion here. I've put VR headsets on thousands of people, right? I haven't seen a lot of people that instantly go, wow, this is great, I love it. Unless you're younger mm -hmm. or you're older, mm -hmm. I can go into an elder care facility and put a headset on them and they have no complaint about the image quality. They're just amazed that they're with their family or at the zoo or at their old house. Right. So it comes down to story is the new quality. Okay. The problem with creators today in this space is they put the camera down because they don't know what to do with it. Right. They record some footage. Yeah. They put it in a headset. They go, oh, look at this. They look around. They go, well, I see a stitch line over there, and this doesn't look right, and I can see the pixels in the headset and whatever. Okay? That's because there's no story. Well, right? so you bring ahead. up a great point, and I've, I've always said this about motion pictures. You know, if there is no story in that motion picture, then I'm not interested because... You know, a story drives it. And anything that takes away from that story makes it a, a worse movie. Absolutely. And I'm going to give you two quick examples. One is I sold a camera to a guy who runs um, a trade show company. They build trade show booths for things like NAB. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he bought the camera and talked to him about a month and a half later at another show. I said, hey, how's it going? He goes, oh, it's a terrible camera. It's useless. Can't do anything. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, I made videos and they're just so boring. I'm like, well, what did you do? Well, during the show, I took the camera and I set it in the booth and I recorded some footage here and then I went over to another part of the booth and I recorded some <laughs> over there and I recorded <laughs> over there and then I stitched it together to kind of give you like a feeling that you're doing a virtual tour and it's boring and it's dumb. And I, wow, you got an opinion. I said, how did you do it in the past? And he said, oh, you know, I'm a Canon shooter, so I bring my Canon camera. I usually start with an establishing shot and do an overview. Right. I then go in and try to find some activity that's happening. I might do an over-the-shoulder shot. Once I get all of my shots, I go, I, I go into post. I put together my story. I put in titles. I put in some music. And my clients love it. Like, they watch these oh. videos and they go, my booth is amazing. And I asked him, tell me, why did you not do that? with your VR camera? <laughs> a very right? good question. And he looked at me like I had three heads. And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, he like legitimately said, I, I don't know why I didn't do that. So I challenged him, go out and actually tell a story. Like, do what you do in 2D standard video, but do it in an immersive environment. Make the right cuts. May have the right timing, have the right camera placement, make sure there's a story, all of those components. And then people will follow and do and interact more with your, with your project. So that's number, example number one. The second one I'm going to give you is a camera that we did um, very similar 
I was going to grab it, but I won't. Oh, oh uh, here, here, down. I can get it. All right, there you are. Yeah. So this is the Views camera. It has eight cameras around it. It makes two virtual reality videos in parallel, one for your left eye, one right. for the right eye. I bring this camera up because we worked with National Geographic and NASA and sent the Views camera to the International Space Station. Oh, okay. okay. Wow. Um, they then beam back uh, the footage. We rendered it in 4K by 4K file format, so we did 4096 by 4096 resolution. Then we had a full 4K video left and right eye. Oh, I'd love to see that. National Geographic, I have it right here. Um, National Geographic then built it in as part of a series they were doing um, with something called One Strange Rock. Uh, One Strange Rock is um, uh, a series of documentaries that really talk about this strange rock, Earth around us, and all these different oh, okay. pieces. And they did this VR component from the International Space Station, A Day in the Life. And you start off in a dark environment, and you see the sun rising behind the horizon, and you get the voiceover of, I've spent 95 days off the Earth, weightlessness. And then you get in, and you're floating through the International Space Station, and you end up in the cupola where you're looking out, and you're watching the, the sun rise over the horizon or set, because the way it goes around the, right. the Earth. And I have never had somebody take off that headset and say, well, I saw the pixels, and there's a <laughs> stitch line over there, and what's that weird thing that is like, feel, looks like it's following the camera? Because they're engrossed with the story. Right. Right? The medium that's delivering the story is a tool. The audio, the visual, the titles, the voiceover, right? The narrative. It builds the emotion, the flying through the space. Oh, that has to be interesting. It is. It I'll, has, it has. I'll show it to you later yeah. when we're done with the interview. Yeah. yeah, it has to be interesting. And so that's why I say quality, excuse me, story is the new quality. But do you think with VR, you have to use a different technique for telling story than you do with uh, you know, standard 2D? Of course. Of course. Um, I don't want to oversimplify it. So there's two different basic formats of virtual reality. One, you can do full 360 3D VR video. Right. And when I say VR video, I mean left and right eye, proper right. stereo, very comfortable. And now there's this thing called VR 180. Right, right? Which, so the, which is what that folded out is. Exactly. So this is 360 2D. Right. You wouldn't want to put that in a headset. No. There's actually one caveat to that. We can talk about it later if we get to it. Yeah. But, um, but then you open it up. Now I have stereo 180. Okay. So... The change that you have to do as a storyteller is change from doing, um, using your frame mm -hmm. to focus attention to use distance and audio oh, okay. and characters to build tension or drama or emotion or movement or emotion, right? Because you don't have a zoom effect. You don't have a limited field of view. You don't, you know what I mean? So yeah. your storytelling tools include camera placement, subject object placement, and then character placement in dialogue. Um, if I leaned over and got 18 inches from your face right now, you'd be like, Jim, back off, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing happens in a VR headset. You can make somebody feel very comfortable. You can add that angst. You can create those types of things. They actually found that to be with Cinerama, with the three-strip process. They actually had to have people not actually look at each other for it to look like on the screen they were looking at each other. Exactly. And they had fixed lenses because you could not zoom, you could not with Cinerama. The yeah. three The three-strip process, they, you know, they had the only could only do it with subject and and camera movement. They could create movement. So you look at a camera like this, right? Mm -hmm. Our company's name is Human Eyes. This is the Views camera, but they're basically like human eyes—a left and a right eye. Right. So if you're a director, really sitting at a place with your eyes, you don't need a little no. loop or anything. Right? Just sit with your eyes. That's what you're going to get. And if I look at you, I focus my attention down to a very narrow field of view. Right. Everything in my periphery is kind of out of focus. And of course, what you're saying is if you're in a VR environment and someone starts talking, you're going to pan over That's to right. that person. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna... 
I got into a bit of a battle with <laughs> some folks. So I sit on, uh, I, I participate in the Imaging Alliance and, and the board there. And, you know, there's this battle. Like the industry's kind of confused from a photo perspective. Like, oh, are photographers ever going to really do this? And why would a videographer want to do it? And so I, I, I'm challenging these executives from major companies put on a headset and go do something like go to the ncaa playoffs and watch a game in vr hmm and that you know the pendulum swings to wow why would i do that that's dumb my wife is sitting there and i'm going to put on a headset and i'm going to be ridiculous to oh my god i was able to enjoy the game in a way that i hadn't before. Well, I imagine it'd be much more immersive than watching it on TV. It is. It's much more immersive. And if I want to just hand over the keys to the director, in the NCAA project, they actually have something called Director's Cut. And so if you click the Director's Cut button, then you're basically, just like broadcast television, you're taking the feed and the camera decisions of that director throughout that experience, right? Uh, Ball's oh, okay. moving down to the other side. We're going to look at the, the camera that's underneath. Oh, we're at, we've got a timeout. We're going to do a floor level camera of the cheerleaders doing their thing, right? I mean, it just automatically happens and you sit there and you watch it. But you don't sit there and stare ahead. Like, yeah. I, I watched the series. It's really fascinating for me. I love this stuff. But I sat on my couch in my living room at home. I have a big TV on the wall. Absolutely beautiful color. It looked great. I was watching the game. Very good. Put on the headset right? Okay, it's lower resolution, it's everything else. At first, I found myself looking forward, right? Mm -hmm. And having this action oh, go yeah, back of course. and forth. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. But then I found myself actually tracking with the motion and looking and going and then choosing a different camera and seeing a different effect or going and sitting down in the photographer's aisle at the end of the, the right. court and you're down there with the other photographers oh, and you see their lenses and popping I, and out and I everything. I love being down there because I did sideline oh, did photography you? for a I, long time. It was absolutely fascinating. And then I take off my headset and I watch some of it on TV. And I'm like, okay, this is great. But I actually started feeling like, okay, I'm just staring ahead and watching this screen in front of me. And when you do that for a while, you really start to desire the ability to look around, to, sure. to engage with that medium. And I think that's the hardest part for people to understand about VR and particularly VR video, because if you're doing a VR digitally created world, something called uh, real-time rendered content, so something mm -hmm. that was programmed in Unity or Unreal and the entire thing right. is a digital world, yeah. right? Like game. You know, yeah, then you're, then you're like game, gamified and gamification and you're moving through things. And, right. Okay, fine. But when you start watching video and linear video and branch narratives and that kind of stuff, it's too easy to kind of just sit there and look and feel like I'm missing on something else. But then if you actually start to engage with it and move with it, the level of immersion, you don't think about the quality after a while. You start thinking about the experience. Oh, and yeah. And it's that experience that really drives the satisfaction at the end of it. Well, I watched on my Apple TV, there's a VR channel, and I was able to ride along with the Blue, Blue Angels. Nice. And that was cool. That is really cool. That was really cool. Because you could look guy. all around the cockpit, you could look over the other planes, you know, it was just, just by, because with the Apple TV, you had that touch remote, so you could just pan it around wherever you wanted it. Yeah, that's really cool. We had a guy here today, uh, his name is Scott, with uh, Redshirt Media. And he's a specialist in mounting cameras on the exterior of aircraft, oh, acrobatic cool. aircraft. And oh, stuff. neat. Somebody you might want to talk to as far as just some of that out of the world stuff that you do. Um, but earlier he did a program or a project where he worked with, I think it's called the Yak 152. I maybe, I maybe got the number wrong, but it's Y-A-K, I think it's 152. And this is a plane that has one set of wings, mm -hmm. but two fuselages. Two cockpits. Oh, okay. I, I, two engines. So uh, like prop the old engines P36, in the front. Wasn't the P thirty six had two engines? Uh, two. You know. The, yeah, the there World was. War there II, was one. The yeah. World War. I think it was P thirty six. But the the thing that makes this interesting is down the center. Uh huh. They've also strapped on a jet engine. So you have two turboprops oh and a jet God. engine. Oh my and goodness. A, and a camera mounted in there on the outside of the plane, 
And sometimes people would put it on and they start feeling nauseous because, I mean, you're doing rolls and all that kind of stuff. And he found a clever way to help fix it where he took a 2D video of the pilot and put it as a picture in picture in the experience. So when the pilot's getting ready to roll and he looks over his shoulder and rolls, if you look in the direction that the pilot looks, you're going with that motion right. and you're less likely to get sick. That totally makes sense. Same thing with, uh, I did a motorcycle video. I mounted it onto my peg and I did a VR 180 feasibly riding my motorcycle. You got the tank and the handlebars and the, and the mirrors that help give you that cockpit effect so you don't feel so sick. As long as you're going straight, you don't feel sick. You go around a corner. If you continue to look forward, like fixate as the motorcycle's turning, it'll make you feel nauseous. Mm. But if you simply look in the direction the motorcycle's going, you don't get sick at all. So these are the little things that are gonna help people to understand and to tolerate and or adapt to these technologies. You know, not a lot of people know, back when they first started doing motion pictures, not only was it one long cut, the flicker in the movie theaters made people sick. Yes. Yes, yes. They're, right. They're like, oh, this movie thing is never going to work. And well, everybody like gets a, sick in there. It was like 15 frames a second, you know, yeah. something really slow. It wasn't until they got to 24 frames a second that they realized that people worked. Yeah. But, but also I think there's this level of tolerance that we get now. Kids today are starting with their mobile phones very young and they're moving their mobile phone all over the place and they're not, they're not getting sick, you know. So there's a level of tolerance. I used to mm. get car sick a lot. Um, and then I started spending time in VR. I don't get car sick anymore anymore. I don't know if anybody's ever done a study on that, hmm. but my tolerance for motion has gotten so much better. I imagine so. I went sailing. I normally get very sick on boats. Um, I didn't even take any Dramamine or anything, and I was okay. That's great. Again, I might be coincident. It might be age. could be a million different reasons <laughs> as to why not. But I'll go back to when I first started watching VR in a headset. I felt sick. Oh, okay. And even today, I can watch you know, hundreds of Well, they've of had the same problem with 3D. Yeah, you exactly. Know, they, they've had people have, get nauseous in 3D films. Yep. And uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but it's probably a sense of motion that's uh, yeah. disturbing them. But and, of course, 3D has been around for a long time, too. It has. But if you think about our brains, we have built a visual map of everything around us. Right? Whether we think about it consciously, subconsciously, doesn't matter. We all know that a basketball is round, right? Right. If we see a basketball that's oblong, <laughs> we in an experience, we're like, well, something's wrong with that basketball. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because it's not what you think it should be. Right. Right? Those, some of those early challenges that we had of de-warping and mm -hmm. wrapping sure. the video around sure. in this sphere and trying to figure out how to play it back seamlessly, a lot of that stuff is being addressed on a daily basis. And so the experiences are getting better. The tolerance is getting better. The quality is getting better. Yeah. So do you have any um, predictions? It's exciting time. Predictions for VR, you know, for, uh, the, you know, this technology? I do. Okay. My question to you before I answer, are you talking about VR in general? Are you talking about VR video? Are you thinking about... I would say probably VR in general because video is just one aspect of it, right? Okay, exactly. So let, let's start there for a second. I will tell you that in my opinion, all of us will spend a good chunk of our lives in virtual reality in the coming years. And I say all of us, meaning myself, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Right. Um, uh, but even in my lifetime, I will start, I'll, I'll give it three to five years, we'll start spending more time in a headset. Now, I talk to some people that think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. you know, I've got kids, I would never wear a headset, I, I wanna know what's going on. Okay, all of these reasons, that, because they don't get it. But I think we're gonna see ourselves very quickly um, exposed to virtual reality at the workplace. Oh, of course, uh, augmented reality. Certainly. Well, not just augmented reality. So augmented, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, right. So we're happy to go there too. Yeah. But from a virtual reality perspective. Oh, okay. If you think about the benefits of training and simulation. Yeah, in fact, I was at a Microsoft conference here in Las Vegas and they were showing people wearing virtual reality headsets. And what it was is they were showing a different room so this person could fix something in a different room. That's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Because, because, and they were just in like an office. 
Right. So we just started a project with NTT Docomo, um, which is a Japanese telecommunications company. Huge. I mean, it's a, it's a huge company. They're actually doing a test program, a release of 5G network in Guam. Mm. And we're working with them on for the power company, the Guam Power Company, live streaming VR content of repairs to staff, engineers, and new hires so that they can start to uh, learn how to repair these things oh, okay. where they don't necessarily have access to. So for example, in, in a power grid, they may need to fly a crew onto a high tension power line and guys actually sit on power lines and repair things. Right now, to put somebody in that environment is dangerous, right. it's expensive, there's hazards, everything else. But equipped with VR 180 and you're replicating that individual's view, now I can have one or dozens of people watching what's going on there in 3D so you get depth and scale and size broadcast over 5G oh, networks, okay. right? So right. you have very low latency, right? Very high quality, right? And you can add additional information and or stitching and or other things in the edge-based component of the cloud. So not only do I quickly move the data from the camera to the cloud, I could apply calculations to it and can do computing applications and then push that right down to a VR headset. And I could see that in the future going to a drone technology where they're actually flying a drone with VR so they can go and repair something without having to actually be there. Absolutely. Yep. The applications are only limited by our imaginations, <laughs> right? Crazy things. Yeah. Walmart yeah. purchased a lot of headsets. Now, I've heard it's either 15,000 or 30,000. Wow. VR headsets this past year to train Walmart staff on the impact of Black Friday. Oh my goodness. Right, so when the, you open the doors and all the people come crashing through and all that kind of stuff, in order to train their employees what to expect, how to manage it, what to do it, the Oculus goes, they bought all Oculus goes. Wow. Um, I think the number is 30,000, I'm just doing back of the napkin math, maybe I don't know the real number, but 3,000 Walmart stores, 10 headsets per store, You've got 100 employees. Like to me, that's a pretty good ratio. Yeah. Um, but the ROI on that is incredibly steep because think about the number of training hours that you would normally have of bringing in a trainer, bringing in the staff, sure. trying to explain it. Here's a PowerPoint. Read this book. Whatever it is, or I can show you. 15 times in 15 minutes, right? Just watch the video after video of different openings and different types of things to expect or things to come across. And, and, and being in, in, in VR, they can look at any part of where they are. That's right. Yeah, so training and simulation is huge. And to go back to your original question, um, we will live part of our lives in a virtual reality headset. We might be going to virtual meetings, we might be going sure. to training and simulation, but we will also start looking for social outlets. And it might not be the millennials or the that are doing it because a lot of that middle generation, oh, they're too self-conscious. What if somebody sees me with it? I don't like <laughs> it. A lot of examples. But I have a son that works in elder care. And when you start thinking about the possibilities of addressing loneliness for people who are in assisted living facilities that don't have the ability to travel, that don't have the opportunity to go outside, that can't go to the neighborhood that they grew up in, right? If I can give this camera to a family member and then go back to the house right. where dad lived or mom lived and record familiar things and put them in a headset, the simple piece of either combating loneliness or addressing uh, de-escalation because a lot of these people, especially in the dementia units and, and memory care, they get disoriented, they get confused, they get agitated. You have to, you have to work to de-escalate those situations. 
the power of being able to put somebody in an area where you can eliminate everything that's around and de-escalate that conversation with something as simple as a video is so incredibly powerful. And that's the kind of stuff that, why I am such a believer that not only will we all spend part of our lives in virtual reality, we will continue to embrace it and find new uses for the technology that we have not thought of at all today. Well, this has been a great conversation and I would love to continue on, but of course, uh, you know, we, we gotta get on with our lives too. I know. <laughs> yeah, the, the real life, the, the realities. Every time I sit down and talk with you, we always seem to go into like really interesting places. Um, really big picture concepts are some of the stuff that I talked about today. Um, I have a huge passion for this. So if I any of tell. your viewers um, want to get in, if they want to challenge what I have to think or some of my beliefs, um, you know, hey, let, let's go have a conversation. Right now, the industry is what I call coopetition. It's time for us to work together to figure out how and, and how do we give people a more rewarding, interactive, something environment that makes their lives better. I'm a big proponent that VR is part of that. And so I say game on, let's go. Well, I've always said technology can either be used for good or not. <laughs> that is very true. I'm going to go down the good path. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, with that note, thank you, Jim Malcolm, for this conversation. This is Alan here at in the view, uh, Humanized View Suite. Yeah. And uh, we will talk at you later. Subscribe to Personal View's YouTube channel, and we'll see you later.